In Isaiah chapter 2 we read, This is what Isaiah son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Well, welcome again, everybody. You'll have appreciated by now that today is Remembrance Sunday. I don't know about you, but I have never known a Remembrance Sunday like this. Life is completely strange. I've been experiencing emotions that I've kind of never had before and I didn't know what to do with them or how to handle them. I find that people I meet know exactly what's wrong, but none of them can agree. Uh, I look over the Atlantic to America and see that in confusion. I see our own government sometimes not seeming to know which way to turn. I wouldn't want to be in their shoes because they can't do right for doing wrong. Um, the word I would use is that it's all very bewildering. When I look back in history to World War II, the government appointed a spiritual leader for the nation. That person was C.S. Lewis and he was able to speak over the radio about really basic Christian things. But when I come to the current time I find there is no desire it seems to have a spiritual leader. I find myself wondering where are we the church in all of this difficulty. I was going to say, I wonder where Jesus is, but I know where Jesus is. He's here and he's living with us and he's living in us. And maybe the one thing that we can learn in this time is to live in his presence. I wanted to share a Bible story with you and I was kind of thinking things through as to where in the Bible there was lockdown. And there was lots of occasions and just quickly I can think of Joseph I can think of Daniel, I can think of Peter. But you might want to pick up your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 16 and read that story. There were two people there, seriously in lockdown. Remind yourself about what they did, what God did, and what the outcome was. I hope you'll find that a great encouragement. So, let's pray. Father, today is a day when lots of people have very sad memories. We just ask that you would be with them, comfort them. There are people living with the effects of conflict. We'd ask that you would be with them and put your arms around them. Lord, we think of our government. There's so much conflicting information. Decisions are so hard to make. We just would ask that somewhere in there someone would speak the truth because the truth will shine light. We would that it would be possible that there would be someone who would speak up on your behalf and tell people the good news. 
And in that regard, we think of ourselves as a church, that we would know how to stand for you and to shine forward your light in this dark and confusing place. Lord, you seem to be teaching us things. You've taken away all the things that we're so familiar with in terms of meeting as a church. But you have given us things. You've given us your book, the Bible. But most of all, you've given us your Holy Spirit to live with us and in us. And we thank you for that. And we just would ask that you would come and find us at this time and that you would te teach us to live in your presence and to grow in the relationship that you have made available. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were prepared to come down here into this confused world and put things right for those who seek you. And we'd ask you to do that today. Amen. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all here. If you're new, of course, we'd love to get in contact with you, but it's good that you could join us. I'd love to be able to say that there were lots of church meetings that you could join us with this week, but of course, all those things are closed down. The one thing we do have is a prayer meeting on Thursday nights uh, and a bit of a Bible study, a bit of a time to think about Christian things. And we do that on Zoom. Um, at the moment, maybe seven, eight families get together at eight o'clock on, on Thursday evenings. It would be lovely if more of you would join us in that. Um, if you could let us know, we can send you the email, email you'll get the contact details and you'll now find that Zoom is actually very easy to get into and you can join us in that service. So I'd encourage you to do that. Also, I'd encourage you to stay in contact with one another. There's, there's ways available. We can pick up the phone, can't we? We can email, we can use message services. Um, do that. Let's share our experiences at this time. Let's share the good news, but let's also share the things that we're finding difficult. Don't be sitting there in despair on your own, wondering where to turn. Please pick up the phone or something, get in contact with us. There will be a way that we can meet and we can talk and encourage one another. It's now time for Holly to bring us the children's presentation. I know that we all look forward to this every week and I just pray that that will be a, a blessing to you. And then after that, Chris will uh, take over the service and lead us with prayer, with another hymn, and then share his thoughts with us for this morning. Thank you.
Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we, Lord, thank you for all that you are and for all that you have given us in your word, a word which never fails and a word which shall not pass away. We praise you for it, Lord, and for the tremendous stability it brings to our lives. <clears throat> Father, on this day of the year, we <coughs> draw aside, we set time aside to pay tribute to those who fought in the great wars and especially those who perished in those wars. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that your word does tell us that you will bring about an end to war. But Lord, we do remember those who passed away and whose lives were lost in the conflict. <clears throat> Father, we do pray that uh, there might be an end to uh, the wars that take place in, in the world. We thank you that uh, in those great wars you did indeed deliver the world from, from the evil that was facing it. And uh, we thank you that since those wars we have not had another great worldwide war. We thank you for your mercies in these things. But how we pray that the day will dawn when war is no more. We know, Father, that it is only through the gospel that swords will be beaten into plowshares. It is only through the gospel that true peace will ever be found. And to that extent, O oh Lord, we pray for the prosperity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray even on this day, as we look back to the past uh, horrors of war, we pray, Lord, that you would bless the preaching of the message of Jesus Christ among all the nations. We pray, Lord, that those in the Middle East will hear of the Messiah Jesus. We pray that those in the Americas and Africa, Lord, and indeed on the Australasian constant continents, Lord, we ask and pray that the gospel will have a brighter day. We thank you for all that it has already accomplished in the world. We know that it is through the gospel that already much peace came to the world. But Lord, we do pray that you would bless it in the days that lie ahead. We particularly pray this, Lord, if the world is perhaps heading for, for dark days, for dangerous days, for days when it will be uh, difficult to be one of your saints. Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us. We pray that you would work in our hearts and uh, help us to be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ and to be willing, even as those people were in days of war, that we too will be willing to lay down our lives rather than to surrender to an enemy uh, whose intent is harm and evil. So, Father, we just pray then that you would bless the preaching of the word, bless it here where we live, Lord, in Ripon and in Yorkshire. We pray that we might yet see days when people are challenged and converted, Lord, and come to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ and see how worthy he is of praise and honour and adoration. We ask it in his precious name. Amen. Lazarus raised from the dead. So a part of God's story is how he brought a man back to life. And it goes like this. Jesus had three really good friends, Mary, Martha, and their brother, Lazarus. One day, Lazarus got really sick. He was so sick that he might die. Mary and Martha knew the only one who could save Lazarus was Jesus. So they sent someone to find him. They found Jesus traveling whilst telling people about God. Now, you might think that Jesus would rush right away to heal his friend, but he stayed where he was for two more days. You see, Jesus knew something that no one else knew. Lazarus had died, but Jesus was going to bring him back to life so that they would believe that Jesus really was the Son of God. When Jesus finally got to Lazarus' house, he had been dead for four days. Mary and Martha were heartbroken. 
They said to Jesus, If you had been here, our brother would not have died. Jesus said, Your brother will rise again. Martha didn't understand at first. What Jesus meant was that he would actually bring Lazarus back to life. Because Jesus is the Son of God, he is more powerful than death. Jesus looked up and prayed to God. Then he said with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Lazarus's bandages were removed and he was alive and well. Everyone was so happy. Jesus knew all along that he could bring Lazarus back to life. Jesus wanted people to see who he was, the Son of God. And he wanted to show God's greatness and that he can do anything. The reading for today is from Isaiah chapter 40 and reading from the first verse. Speaking uh, through Isaiah, God says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she is received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up on the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd, he will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. That was God's word in Isaiah 40, 1 to 11. <clears throat> now, I wasn't born yet when World War II came to an end in 1945, but I've seen pictures of the tremendous celebrations and the joy when that happened. Troops returned home to families. People who had been in prison of war camps were released and were free again and could taste freedom. Now, that sort of jubilation is what these verses in Isaiah are really all about. God tells Isaiah to go and comfort his people. And he tells Isaiah to tell his people that their warfare is ended. Uh, the Hebrew word there can also mean that her time of service was over. And that's also a military picture. People get conscripted into a, an army. But uh, when that time is over, they are released. But the background to these words is that they were not written on Jerusalem's VE day. They were actually uh, written long before that. Uh, Isaiah didn't write this on the day that the troops were coming home. In fact, he wrote them over a hundred years before that event took place. In other words, God gave his people a, a message to bring comfort and courage to them in the time when they were living in exile, having lost the war. <clears throat> they had been defeated by the Babylonians, they were in exile, and during that 70 years of exile, <clears throat> their world would have felt battered and broken, and the future looked very bleak. <clears throat> so God prepared a message beforehand 
to bring comfort to them in that day of that time of distress and to bring them some light uh, amidst the gloom and the darkness. <clears throat> and the essence of this message was that God would bring an end to their war <clears throat> and to the struggles that they were going through. <clears throat> now, I'm not planning to go through all the verses we read in Isaiah. I'm really going to just focus on that one verse where it says, Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended. But the background, the verses that that verse comes from, in verses 3 to 5, uh, God gave a picture uh, of him coming to their aid and the way being cleared before him, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and so on. So God clears the way for coming to their aid. Verses 6 to 8 then reminded them that although this world is a place of changing fortunes, God's word endures forever. Verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God <coughs> stands forever. And then in verses 9 to 11, he tells them this tremendous uh, good tidings. He says, go up onto the mountains and proclaim this good tidings. You could well say, go and proclaim this gospel. <coughs> he says, behold, the Lord will come with his strong arm. So God comes with a strong, mighty arm. But verse 11 says, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently <clears throat> lead those who were with young. So the picture then is this, of this mighty God coming to their aid, mighty in power, and yet coming with the tenderness of a shepherd. <clears throat> so that's the background to the verse that we're looking at. <clears throat> but the fact that verse 3 <clears throat> where he says the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway for our God uh, that as you know is quoted in the New Testament and it's applied in fact very early in the New Testament as early as Matthew chapter 3 and it's applied to John the Baptist and in other words it shows that this promise of God bringing the warfare to an end wasn't limited to physical Jerusalem. <laughs> it's not just for, for Jerusalem, uh, uh, the city, but indeed it's a promise that I believe all of God's people can take hold of. God promises to bring an end to our warfares. <laughs> God sends us his comfort. <laughs> so I just want to briefly point out three great struggles that uh, all of us go through, non-Christians and Christians, in the world in which we live. There are three great battlefronts, three great war fronts that we all face, but which will not last forever. The first one we, we could call is the battle in nature. <clears throat> Life in this world is not always easy. I'm sure you've noticed that by now. <clears throat> Living in Yorkshire, you may think that's not the case, but life is difficult. In many parts of the world, life is an ongoing struggle for survival. Uh, it's, and then there are times when uh, extraordinary things happen, like hurricanes and floods and earthquakes, which make it even more devastating. And the Bible traces the reason for this tremendous battle in the world all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God said to Adam, because you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. So that's a picture of a battle. It's a picture of sweat and of tears. And of course, the blood came later. But it was a picture of toil and hardship and struggle. And that's why even in the New Testament, we find the Apostle Paul speaking of this damage to the world uh, that man's rebellion had brought. And he says, the whole creation, all of creation is groaning ever since it was subjected to bondage and decay. That's in Romans 8 and verse 22. 
So we shouldn't be surprised or over dismayed if we go through times when it may feel as if nature is at war with us. <clears throat> How devastating it must have been for people who experienced a tsunami <clears throat> or how distressing it has been for people even in this time of the COVID who have been separated from families, grandchildren and so on. Some have even passed away and uh, families haven't been able to have a proper funeral. So, so even for folk like that, uh, life and nature has been distressing. <clears throat> but what is the believer's hope and comfort? Well, it's simply this. These things too will come to an end. <clears throat> The Apostle Peter speaks of the day, he says, uh, the day that will come when these present heavens and the earth will pass away with a roar. The earth and all its works will be laid bare. But then he adds these words, according to God's promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <laughs> that will be the day when the warfare of nature is ended. We will no longer be under the sorts of things that we endure now. <clears throat> Secondly, <clears throat> there is a battle that rages within ourselves. There was a man in the Old Testament who put it well when he said, Just as surely as sparks fly upwards, so man is surely born for trouble. <clears throat> and how true that is in the world. Wherever you find people, you will eventually find sparks flying. <clears throat> But it's not just that we are at war with others. There is more often than not a war going on in our own lives. Uh, isn't that the reason why alcohol and drugs and other rebellious behavior can play such a big devastating part in, in the world? And sadly, isn't that why overdoses and suicides are a, a, a growing reality in the world in which we live? Many people are at war within themselves. But men and women don't only have battles raging in their own life with their neighbor or with themselves, but the Bible says that an unconverted person is also at war with God. Now, there will be many men and women who say, look, I don't have any quarrels with God. I, I, I'm not at war with God. I may not be religious, but I don't hate God and so on. Well, that might be how they see themselves. But listen to how the Bible describes us in our unconverted state. In Colossians 1 and verse 22, Paul said, An unconverted person is alienated from God. There's a distance. There's a separation. And he says, They are hostile in their mind. Might not always show on the surface, but if events in life go wrong, you will see that hostility come out to the fore. In Ephesians 2, 1, Paul said, an unconverted person is dead through sin. They've separated themselves from the life God gives. And he says they serve the passions of their sinful nature. And by nature, they are children of wrath in God's eyes. So the Bible says that though an unconverted person may say, I'm not at war with God, the problem is, is while they continue in sin, God is at war with them. And that's the most earnest thing that we need to, to realize that that's what the Bible teaches. <clears throat> but the good news <clears throat> is that this is also a war which God brings to an end. The Bible teaches that God has graciously opened a way of reconciliation and peace from his side. He's taken the initiative. He's come with terms of peace. And he made this peace possible through the blood of the cross. When Jesus Christ took the sins of men and women onto himself, and then gave himself as a sacrifice that atones for those sins, then the barrier that separated man and woman from God was removed. The war was over. A peace had been made possible. And so in Romans 5, the apostle says, he says, if it was while we were still God's enemies that he did all that and reconciled us to himself 
through the death of his son, how much more, now that we've been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? If God came to us while we were fighting him and hostile in thought and deed and mind and said, I've come to bring you peace and reconciliation, then once that offer has been entered into, how much more will we have a God who blesses our life? You see, the gospel is a message that speaks comfort to the sinner. It shows how when iniquity is pardoned, the warfare with God is over. And this ending of our struggle with God uh, and with sin is not only before we were converted, it actually continues after our conversion as well. Romans 7.22, Paul says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that is at war with my mind. It makes me a slave to sin and it's still within me. Now, I'm persuaded that Paul was speaking of the battle that even Christians experience. But he goes on to ask in the next verse, he says, OK, you're going through the struggle. He says, is there any freedom to be had in this battle? And in verse 25, he says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And why is Jesus Christ the end of this war that even Christians experience the struggle with the old nature of sin? Well, the very next chapter starts with the words, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. So when a believer realizes that he or she has been declared righteous by God, Notice that it's not that they've suddenly become better people, they've changed their ways, they don't do anything wrong anymore. It's when they have been acquitted and declared righteous by God, there is no longer any condemnation. There is no heavy swords, as it were, of Damocles hanging over their head. They are free, they are justified, they are forgiven. And then they realize that victory is theirs. Will they still stumble? Yes, of course. Will God suddenly turn around and condemn them because they've stumbled? No, not at all. The war is over. Peace has been made with God. And they've been reconciled through the blood of the cross. <clears throat> One last point then. <clears throat> we've seen there was a battle in nature. And we've seen there is a battle in ourselves. But there's also a final battle that every one of us must face unless Jesus returns soon. And it's the battle we could call of journey's end, the final frontier. Once again, I've heard or read of unconverted people saying, I'm not afraid of dying. Uh, it's no big deal there. You don't pay taxes anymore. And they take the whole matter lightheartedly and casually. But there's a verse in the Old Testament that people like that should take note of. An enemy king had sent a message to the king of Israel saying, I'm going to crush your city. And when I'm finished, there won't be enough dust to even give my soldiers uh, a handful of the dust of your city. <clears throat> that was a big boast. And the king of Israel sent a message back and said, the one who puts his armor on should not boast like the one who takes his armor off. In other words, we must never put on this bravado and boast before the battle. Once the battle is won, we can rejoice, we can celebrate and delight. Death is no joking matter. By nature, it is a dark and daunting valley. For most of us, I suspect that it will be a long journey. Those hospital visits, those drips, those visits from relatives and friends and the oncoming darkness that we know is there. But for many, it might be sudden. For many, it might come into a heart attack, a, a car accident, that can happen. But even for those people for whom it comes suddenly, the Bible says in Hebrews 9.27 that people, men and women, are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And that's surely a big part of the reason why death can be such a daunting last battle. 
the soul begins to realize they are going to stand and meet the Creator. They are going to have to give an account for their life in this body. But what does the Bible say? What's the wonderful message regarding this final battle? When in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, We know that if this earthly tent, referring to our frail bodies, is destroyed, we have a building from God, something more solid, something more substance, an eternal house in heaven. Perhaps he was thinking of those words that Jesus spoke to his disciples when he said, In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. So Christians know, they believe and they know that when death shuts down this frail tent, when the guy ropes are slacked and the tent collapses, we have something more permanent to look forward to. Our spirit will ascend to be with our Lord and our Saviour. And there's something even better after that. In Corinthians 15, 25, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Jesus Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Paul was speaking there of the ultimate victory that Christians will share in. God will clothe us again with a resurrection body. And that's why Paul ends that chapter by saying, Death has been swallowed up in victory. For the believer in Christ, when it comes to the final battle, God assures us, say to Jerusalem, her warfare is over. <clears throat> Our warfare is over. Now, doing a recorded message like this, I obviously don't know who will get to see it or hear it. But if you are someone who has come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Saviour, then I, I hope these thoughts will have been a comfort and an encouragement to you in these days of stress. Our war is mostly over already. God has made peace through the blood of the cross. But we will still encounter those struggles with sin. But God promises the day will come when we will be in that new resurrection body and sin will be no more. We've got that daunting battle of, of the grave to yet face. And that can be daunting even for a believer. But I'm sure that even in the darkness of that day, this message where God says, your warfare is over, will cheer our hearts. So take courage. And in these days of COVID and so on, yes, it may look as if nature is attacking us, but God is the one who is ultimately still in control. But if by any chance somebody happens to see or hear or listen to this who is still hesitating at the crossroads and there's two roads before you, uh, the one option that faces you is to keep on living in what we could call the Cold War relationship with God. You might remember how after the World Wars there was this long period of Cold War between Russia and America and so on. And that describes the state of many people who have not come to Christ. There's a cold war between God. The open hostilities may not be seen, but the division, the gap, the separation, the alienation is there. That's the one road. You can continue down that road. But you know that the end of that road leads to disaster, defeat and disaster. But there is the other option of seeking with all your heart to receive God's terms of peace, to receive the, the way that God has made for victory to be yours. And if that is the case, may I urge you then with these words of comfort that God spoke through Isaiah, where he says the warfare is ended. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus speaks of himself as being the one who gives peace. And God calls you to come to his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lay down your rebellion. Lay down those weapons of rebellion, whatever they may be. Confess your sins to him. 
Confess the rebellion that has marked your life till now and then rest on him for his forgiveness. He's made the peace possible through the very blood of his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will be saved. The war will be ended. May God bless that to our hearts. Amen. For all the saints Who from their labors rest Who thee by faith Before the world confess Thy name, O Jesus Be forever blessed Alleluia Alleluia Thou wast their rock, their fortress and their might. Thou, Lord, their captain, in the well-fought fight. Thou, in the darkness, drew their one true light. Alleluia, Alleluia. Soldiers, faithful, true, and bold, fight as the saints who nobly fall of old and win with them the victor's crown of gold. Alleluia, Alleluia. Paradise the blessed Alleluia